Anderson Smith here, and today we're going to talk about learning. In fact, this week we're going to talk about learning. So far we've talked a lot about things that are sort of pre-wired into the brain and our sense organs. And now we're going to talk about how we actually acquire new information, how we learn. When we talk about learning, we have to first realize that we infer learning is taking place. You can't see learning. You can't see perception. You can't see memory. You infer that it exists because of something that happens in behavior. If we see a change in behavior that's relatively permanent, we call that learning. Change is important because it's forming new associations, it's acquiring new information, it's learning. It also results from experience. It takes some experience to occur in the environment for us to learn. And it's relatively permanent, as I said. Now, this, when we talk about learning, we talk about different kinds of learning. We can talk about habituation, which is really the simplest kind of learning. We'll talk about classical conditioning, or Pavlovian conditioning. We'll talk about operant conditioning, or Skinnerian conditioning. We'll talk about social learning, or observational learning. All of these are ways in which we can acquire information from the environment. Now, habituation is the simplest form of learning. It's really a reduction in a startle response or an orienting response with repeated exposure. The first time at Georgia Tech I heard the whistle go off, I happened to be in a room pretty close to the whistle, it was very startling. But now, even as loud as it is, it occurs, I don't even notice it because I'm habituated to that because of experience. Years ago, Tinbergen actually observed this. He had a in a, in a group of young turkeys, he had a cardboard cutout looking like this to fly by overhead the young turkeys. And if he went this way towards the bottom with the long sort of neck in the front, the turkeys didn't react to it. But if he did it the reverse way, going that way, with the small appendage in the front, the turkeys reacted, ran around, and acted startled. Now, at first, they thought, well, this is sort of the turkey's innate fear of prey birds, because it, this way it looks like a hawk, that way it looks like a goose or a duck. But what they really discovered was that it, that, that reaction, that startle reaction to the hawk-like model was because it had seen many geese fly over the turkey yard, many ducks, many geese, and so it habituated to the model when it was going that way but not when it was going that way, and so it had startle responses. So because of repeated exposure of the long neck goose flying over, it habituated to that. The startle response was actually much smaller. Habituation. Classical conditioning is where we learn new associations. It was discovered by a res Russian physiologist, Ivan Pavlov, who was really stu studying the digestive system of the dog. And he noticed something very interesting. He noticed that when the staff came into the room, the dog was hooked up to measure saliva. They, they, when they came into the room, the dog started his salivation. Not when the food powder was sprayed into the mouth, but when the people came into the room to spray the food powder in the mouth. So he said, well, let's study this more, more carefully. And he studied it by actually pairing a neutral stimulus with the... Uh, Stimulus had led to uh, salivation. By the way, here's a statue of Pavlov with one of his dogs in Russia. He actually won the Nobel Prize before he discovered classical conditioning because of understanding the digestive system in, of, of, the, uh, of animals. Now, what's required for classical conditioning is first a conditioned stimulus leading to an unconditioned response. In this case, spraying a food powder into the mouth of the dog led to salivation. You can measure the amount of salivation. So unconditioned stimulus leads to unconditioned response. Then you pair a neutral stimulus, one that doesn't lead to salivation, with the unconditioned stimulus, in this case a tone, a sound, and eventually the pairing of the unconditioned stimulus with the conditioned stimulus leads to a conditioned response, a response salivation, but it's been a learned response now. You don't normally salivate when a sound is made, but because of the association with the unconditioned stimulus, 
now conditioned response occurs. So in Pavlov's experiment, meat powder was the unconditioned stimulus that leads to salivation. He compared that with a sound, a conditioned stimulus, and now the conditioned stimulus leads to salivation. A learned new association, previously neutral stimulus now produces the conditioned response. Now the conditioned response is not identical to the unconditioned response. It usually is less magnitude and it might even be qualitatively different. But it is a new association that's been learned by pairing the unconditioned stimulus to a new neutral stimulus, the conditioned stimulus. Now there's certain phenomena that are associated with classical conditioning and let me just mention what they are. First, extinction. If now I present the conditioned stimulus alone without pairing with the unconditioned stimulus, eventually this response will decline and go away. That's called extinction. Interesting though, if you just wait some period of time and now put the conditioned stimulus present, you'll see spontaneous recovery. Now you'll see the conditioned response. Won't be as high as the conditioned response was originally, but it will recover and you'll see it. Then if you extinguish it again, spontaneous recovery will even be less the next time. But if you wait a period of time after extinction and then put the conditioned stimulus, you'll see the conditioned response. You also can have second order conditioning where I pair a new neutral stimulus with the neutral stimulus as the conditioned stimulus and it will lead to association with this new second order stimulus. So if I pair a light with the tone that leads to salivation, eventually the light will take on a conditioned response of salivation. There's also discrimination. You can actually have one stimulus that will produce the, um, if it's different, will produce the conditioned response while another stimulus that's different will not. That's discrimination and you actually can get stimulus control by reinforcing with the, with the unconditioned, uh, the, the pairing for the unconditioned response with one stimulus and not with the other stimulus and the animal will learn to discriminate between those two stimuli. At the same time, we can see stimulus generalization. If we put a conditioned stimulus that's similar to the unconditioned stimulus, I mean, conditioned stimulus that's similar to the, uh, a new stimulus that's similar to the conditioned stimulus, then it would lead to the, the conditioned response. Here's a, actually a graph showing uh, the, the tone of a, the conditioned stimulus is 1200 hertz, and if I vary that that stimulus from the original stimulus, the response will go down, condition response, depending upon how different the, the new stimulus is to the condition stimulus for. So if it's 2000 hertz or 400 hertz, I get a much smaller response than it would be if it's 1600 or 800 closer to the condition stimulus of 1200. Generalization. I want to just mention a very interesting aspect of classical conditioning and that's the conditioned emotional response. If I have get an emotion reaction to a previously neutral stimulus, then that conditioned stimulus now will produce that emotional response. For example, if I have a, uh, a stimulus that's simply paired with one that would lead to uh, disgust, for example, or happiness, it can be positive and negative. Uh, it's like the, every time I watch the Star Spangled Banner being played at an Olympics, I sort of get goosebumps on my arms. It's, it's a very emotional response I have from that. That's a learned positive conditioned emotional response. So it can be positive, it can be negative. The c best example is classical aversion. When I was a child, my parents gave me a box, a huge box of raisins in my, in my Christmas stocking. And of course, as you do on holidays, I ate the entire box of raisins. And then I became very nauseous. I got sick and the raisins were the cause of that sickness and to this day I cannot eat raisins and food. I'll actually, if I have a, uh, a breakfast bun that has raisins in it, I'll pick them out. I won't eat it. And it's generalized not only to raisins but any kind of dried fruit like that. Like I can't eat fig newtons. I don't like anything that has that sort of raisin-like quality. Now it's a learn. I, I, I'm, it's not a preference that I had. I used to, I love raisins, that's why I ate the whole box. But because I got sick, I had a condi conditioned emotional response of aversion to raisins and I can't eat them to this day. 
Now let me just give you a couple examples of classical conditioning that you might know about. If you've seen the movie Clockwork Orange, you know that there was a sort of a gang of thugs that went around causing all kinds of violence. And when they were caught, they were actually used classical conditioning to change that. They had them sit and watch violent episodes on a screen while the eyes were kept open, and they were given a drug that made them nauseous, made them sick. And they did that over and over again unt until every time they experienced violence or aggressive behavior of any kind, then they got sick. And therefore, they reduced the violence and aggressive behavior in these group of thugs. And as the movie points out, unfortunately, when they were showing the films of the violent behavior, they also played Beethoven music. And what, what, what caused the extinction was every time they heard classical music, they got sick also. So it quickly extinguished and they became thugs again. An example of classical conditioning. Another good example of, of classical conditioning is semantic conditioning. That was really done in Russia a lot uh, years ago, mainly because of Pavlov being the person who's the father of classical conditioning. This is where they conditioned a particular response to a word. For example, in children, they would say the word good, whatever that is in Russian, and then they would provide a little bit of uh, very ple uh, pleasurable uh, liquid, some cranberry juice or something in their mouth. And they did that, had that over and over and over again until salivation was produced as a response every time they heard the word good. The interesting thing is then they could use this uh, as to look at, at generalization, they could find out what the child thinks is good and what is not good by simply saying a word like mother. Child will salivate, mother is good. Communism, no salivation, uh-oh, that's not good. So it's, it's using generalization to get a sort of involuntary response in the part of the children as to what generalized to the word they were actually conditioned to. Semantic conditioning and the conditioning to, to avoid violence in Clockwork Orange. Just examples of how, how powerful classical conditioning actually is. Thank you.